good up there. All right, so homework assignment was to do some node stuff similar to what we did last class. Everybody get that working one way or another. Okay, um, so today we're going to keep going with some node stuff, but we're going to try, we're going to experiment with uh, Firebase uh, initially. So we're going to look at, uh, go through one of Firebase's uh, tutorials for uh, getting started, that kind of stuff. Uh, then we're going to discuss which one we're going to choose. I already have a pretty good idea in my mind um, which one we're going to choose, but uh, we'll see. And uh, then we want to work on um, an authentication example with whichever technology we choose. Uh, and then we want to look at Heroku for ultimately getting our site hosted someplace that's not sitting on our laptop. All right. So those are goals for today. Evaluate Firebase, <laughs> log in while well, register and log in somehow, and then ultimately push our uh, site to Heroku. Make sense? All right. So let's go and let's look at uh, Firebase. And we're going to do this initially in uh, Node, so we'll keep everything in that same little world because we're focusing kind of on our web um, interface initially. So Firebase, Node.js. That seems like a reasonable enough place to start. All right, so let's see. We can sign up with Google. Should we, should we do that? Should we sign up with Google? All right. We'll, we'll do this one. Okay. My account has been successfully created. So this is for my first app. This is where it's living. Let's go to the quick starts. Let's go to the web. So actually right off the bat, we can look here. So platforms they have it for is web, iOS, Android, and then they have a REST API for everybody else. All right, so right off the bat, we see that if ultimately we're going to be looking at web, iOS, and Android as our targets, well, for us, it's going to be web and iOS, but certainly we would look forward as a future version of the app would run on Android as well, right? So right off the bat, we see this guy having a pretty good, pretty good fit as long as the web version of this is compatible with what we're trying to do. So let's click on web for a quick start. Okay, so we already have our... Um, uh, our account, right? Doesn't actually have me logged in, but whatever. Okay, so to include uh, Firebase um, in your website, we've used this script tag. So this is going to be for front end stuff. So this would be <laughs> if we were using Angular, for example, to talk to a Firebase database, as opposed to talking um, to it on our Node back end. So kind of two different sides to this. Um, so just something to consider here for uh, um, for this guy. Remember we looked at Angular last time? So that exists entirely on the web side of things. All right, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to um, we're going to mix what we did last time with uh, um, uh, with with Firebase. Uh, so what we're going to do is I think I had opened it up here. We're going to start off our project pretty much the same way we did last time by uh, um, using our express generator to uh, create our um, create our directory structure. And mm -hmm. we're going to call this guy initially, uh, uh, we called last one, what, mean test. We'll call this one, uh, what, f fire, uh, firebase test. Is that what it's called, firebase? Firebase. We'll call this firebase test. Fair enough. All right, so let's go in here. And let's see, was, did I put that in Dropbox? All right, 
So we're going to go ahead and we're going to uh, do an express on Firebase test. All right, so it went ahead and created this directory for us, blah, blah, blah. Now, remember last time we uh, had to add the Mongo stuff, right? Well, we're not going to do that this time because we're using Firebase as our data storage instead of Mongo. So we'll go and look at some of the Firebase stuff. So let's go into this directory. So cd Firebase test. Uh, we'll do a package JSON. Looks like this. All right, so let's go over to this Firebase side of things. I'll make this a little bit bigger-ish. Okay, so first of all, we'll go ahead and we'll do uh, npm install Firebase. Um, so this will allow us to use Firebase across all clients. I think this will be across the entire um, uh our entire npm install so that this is similar to what we did with the express uh, express generator so we'll do this guy and I think we're gonna have to do a sudo on this okay oh interesting so um, we mentioned WebSockets before, right, in here? So, uh, and one of the things we talked about with uh, Firebase is uh, when we were discussing it as a possibility is that Firebase pushes any changes back out to its uh, uh, connected clients. So if we have three different web applications all connected with the same Firebase database, and this guy changes something in the database, the other two guys would immediately become aware of it. And that's seemingly being done through WebSockets which makes sense, but we're kind of seeing um, the proof of how Firebase does this stuff. Uh, I think also last time, weren't we speculating who, uh, whether Firebase was actually using App Engine as the back end? I'm pretty sure uh, it does now. So uh, Google purchased <coughs> Firebase. So initially Firebase was probably sitting on top of Mongo. Um, but I think they've integrated it with uh, Google App Engine's stuff uh, Possibly at an optional level, but I think it is connected with Google stuff um, at some level. Um, okay, so we have that. Let's go back in here. Okay. So this is how we use it inside of our node project. So let's go ahead and let's test this. I am guessing... Just for the sake of argument here, let's come out here. We're going to do an ls cd node modules. Okay, no, that installed it locally. So what we actually want to do here then is we're going to come in here. <coughs> Interesting. Oh, did that write to it since we already installed it as a dependency? I think it did. So when we did, when we installed it manually, it went ahead and added it to our uh, package JSON here. <clears throat> so we'll do an npm install, and this should install the rest of the stuff from our package JSON. All right, same problem as we had before, so we need to do a sudo. S-U-D-O. Uh, NPM install. Yeah, NPM install will look at uh, uh, package.json and install everything that's in there. What I found interesting, which makes sense, is that when I manually installed Firebase, it added it to um, the package.json. Seemingly in alphabetical order. <laughs> Actually, they, they put it in there in the right, uh, the actual, where it would fit alphabetically. Just kind of interesting. 
All right, so in any case, what you just saw here, uh, old Alex had the same problem uh, over the weekend. Spe this is probably especially true on a Mac. If you are doing your development on a Mac or possibly, uh, um, I know a couple of you are using Cloud9. Um, is anybody in here using, um, what's the other one that just went freemium again? Nitrous. Um, so those are all hosted platforms. So if you use either uh, Cloud9 or Nitrous, so for example, here's Cloud9, you can um, basically have your own node set up on here if, you, if you'd like and do all your stuff from here. If you uh, either don't have a Mac or maybe you don't want to have some of the issues we have on the Mac, uh, Apple locks down their operating system, which is why I'm having to do that pseudo thing several times. So whenever I say sudo, what that's saying is do this as the super user. That's what sudo does. Um, so typically, if you get a whole bunch of errors like this, uh, you'll notice things in there like, um, I think it originally starts complaining about user local bin, this guy. Uh, this is an, a directory that a normal user doesn't have right access to. So when we're, if you want to, be able to let npm do its job, do a sudo on it, and it'll just do its job, and you hopefully it doesn't completely destroy your machine. <laughs> okay, so now let's, uh, we'll go ahead and open up our file, and we'll start doing this inside of this guy. So I'm gonna close all of these from our project from last time, and we'll open our new project. So this is in Firebase test, app.js. All right, so here's the starting point for all this stuff. I'll go ahead and throw our Firebase daily thing in there, and uh, just to make sure everything is zigging when it's supposed to be zigging. Um, let's go ahead and let's start our server. So we'll do an npm start, I believe it is, right? Yep, npm start. All right, so now it should be listening, what, on port 3000, I think was the default. And as long as this is doing it, so... localhost 3000, there's our express, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so now we have our express server up and running, it's doing its thing, we have uh, uh, included Firebase and it didn't scream. So <laughs> that's our current uh, stable, stable situation. So now let's start doing some stuff with Firebase. So we're gonna start off with this guy. So I'll copy this first. We'll paste it in here. Uh, looks like we can actually do, I'm gonna put that red underneath the Firebase just to keep those together. It won't make a difference here. Okay, and I'm gonna kinda put a gap in here. So this gives us access to Firebase, but now we need to tell it about our specific Firebase application. All right, so that's, we need to go grab that from the Firebase website. Um, let's see. I know it was on the original page, but I want to go back and come back. We're just open up a second page. Firebase. Let's go here. <clears throat> All right, here's our first guy right here. Doesn't look like it's what it should be. I already have one. I created this, but it was my first app when I first logged in. All right, let's just go to manage app. Skip tour.
Uh, did we do the Firebase tools already? Right, we don't need that for anything other than the hosting. Yeah, so Firebase has a built-in hosting thing, but it only allows you to host static files. So that's why we're going to be looking at Heroku for where we're going to host our actual node server. Um, okay. All right, this is our URL. Who? Where? Oh, you're instead of boiling fire, yours is fiery fire? Oh, very nice. Uh, probably. It would probably be best for you to create your own if you're going to be doing for your homework assignment. Um, sp oh, yeah, actually, definitely, because I've had some bad experiences with uh, students writing stuff to public databases on video. <laughs> Nobody is sitting in this room, I'm sure. Actually, I don't think it would. Well, maybe Curcio. Large and probably. That's right. Okay. So let's go back in here. All right, so now we have a reference, a way to write to it. Now at some point, we need to be able to authenticate, right? So here's writing stuff. Let's just copy this, and we'll see what it looks like. Should be able to just do it right up here. Shouldn't make a difference. So we're going to use our Firebase reference, and we're going to set a new object. So just like we talked about last time um, with... MongoDB, everything is JSON based. So here's a JSON object. Title is Hello World. Author is Firebase. Here's just the location stuff. So this is a JSON object with three variables in it. One variable is a string. Another variable is a string. The next one is a JSON object, which has three variables in it string, string, and uh, this is numeric. I'm surprised they didn't just store that as a string because you can technically do math with that zip code, but whatever. All right, so that should set something. All right, and we'll look at saving data here in a second. All right, so let's just go and save that. It looks like that's all that's going to be required to save, so now we just need to restart our server. Correct. All right, guys should be listening now. So I should be able to just refresh this page and it will magically save stuff in the background, is the theory. Okay. Oops, we'll go back over here, go to data, and there's our hello world with a location of San Francisco, California. Okay. Well, right off the bat, it seemed like that saved a lot quicker than <laughs> all the Mongo stuff from uh, from from last time. Uh, okay, so let's look at uh, reading stuff back out of it. All right. Actually, let's look at this guide on saving data here for a few minutes. So we can uh, set data, we can update data. So write some writes or replaces data to a defined path. So for us, we're always writing it. Let's look at what that path is right here. So this is, this is just a top level database, right? As opposed to writing it, we could have sub paths within there for storing like user accounts and that kind of stuff. When we get to uh, authentication, we'll see that. Okay. <clears throat> Update some of the key for defined path without replacing all of the data. Okay, so that means we should then be able to, we have to probably retrieve it first. Okay, so that's writing stuff with
Okay, so here's like the uh, uh, endpoint. So they did a slash web slash saving data slash fire blog. In fact, let's actually we go into our thing over here. So if I change our reference to slash stuff that and then we launch this again should give us a different same data but stored in a different place Okay, so here's the top level database, right? And then inside that we have a table. Maybe we call it a table. Does that sound about right? So we have a table called stuff. And inside stuff we have uh, this information. Let's save something different inside of stuff this time around. So we'll call this guy Woot. And this is Mequon, Wisconsin. Five, three, zero, nine, one, nine, two. Okay, so we'll stop this, restart it. All right, so inside stuff, we have both of these are inside Oops. So this is our original title. Oh, this is the original title. Yes. This title is the one up here. So then within stuff, we should have two titles, shouldn't we? All right, so this completely updates the data. What if I wanted to write two separate records? Or is the record called stuff? Well, then it's fine that it's storing in a tree form, but from my perspective, I should have two things in stuff. One should say hello world, another one should say woot. But the program isn't set like that. Well, I ran the program two different times. Yeah, when you end the program, it's something you can reset. Like, if you end the program... Okay, then I look at the database, it should, it should be clear? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> So inside stuff, we have author,
because the idea is that if we think of stuff as an endpoint, uh, inside of stuff we might want to store more than one thing, right? So now I'm, you know, here, let's, let's go, we'll say blah, the author shouldn't matter. Change this to Grafton. That's Grafton's zip, 53092. 24530. I live in Grafton. <laughs> What's this? Concordia's tennis courts is where the zip code changes? Really? All right, so in, it, so in my view here, I'm about to run this thing again. We're connecting to Firebase again. Here's our Firebase account. I'm a little bit surprised we don't have to authenticate with it in any way in order to write stuff. Um, but we'll we'll burn that bridge in a few minutes, I guess. Um, but then I'm setting this reference. What's this? Okay. Well, regardless, so we're just going to say that we're, we're, we're using it legitimately right now. So my feeling is, is if I'm treating stuff as a table, inside of stuff, I should have a collection of stuff where each thing looks like this JSON. So when I run this again now, I should have a new um, copy of this. Uh, I should have an inside stuff. I should have a second record. That's, that's my belief. Because this is my endpoint up here. When I put my Firebase ref, I did it the boiling fire 3016 Firebase IO slash stuff. I just made this up. Well, I, it seems like you have to. Because I mean, I'm thinking about storing a collection of stuff. So if you're thinking about storing a collection of stuff, wouldn't you want like, a unique identifier for each one? But right now, what you're doing is you're just setting the title to blah, so it might just be overwriting that. Oh, that was what they were talking about back in here when they talked about the different ways of saving data. Okay, so set. Okay, this sets it to a defined path. Update, whatever. Push adds to a list of data in the database. Every time you call push, your database generates a unique ID like that. Okay, so let's see a push. But it seems like push must do what I what I'm trying to, to get it to do. Well, that's what that would be. This so you so essentially this is saying um, instead of calling it my Firebase ref, we would say this is uh, stuff ref, oh, okay. and let's create a second variable. Well, I'm only about ninety four percent sure of what I'm telling you is correct. So let's you said things, it's things ref. Right, so those are two different tables, if you will. So it seems like what you need to do, based on this, is we you use the reference to give yourself a new record. So they said var stuff um, 
entry is equal to stuff ref dot push. Looks like that's what they did here. And they say ref dot child. Where's where's their stuff up top here? <clears throat> okay, so that's ref. And that's the full there, so you actually have to wonder what this ref.child is doing. Is it creating an instance of it? Yeah, so ref is like what we have in, in our code for the, the various references. So when we say ref.child users, Oh, 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 I get it. I get it. So you could use it as a base. So by saying ref.child users here, it's as if we said, had, had two different references up here, and we had a slash fireblog slash users. But instead of having to have two different references like we just did, this allows you to walk from the, the base. We'll, we'll test that. Um, so we're going to say, all right, but then down here is where we do a push. So ref.child. So this created a user ref, which is connected to users. And then what you can do is you can, this is a generic set. So this is always going to be writing to the same place. That's what we've been seeing. It overwrites the same place over and over and over again. But here they said if you use user ref dot child, then you can name it. So let's test that before we break what we're about to do. All right, so I'm going to not do this push thing yet. But I'm going to say uh, this is actually called stuff ref, right? Dot child, another record, dot set. All right, so this should give us within stuff a record called another record is the the way it seems like it should work. Here's another record, and then this other one's just like what generic. So this is like a generic stuff record, and then here's another record, and we change this to another record two. Then we should get another one in there. Here's another record too. I wonder what the purpose of having a generic record under stuff would be. So if I just wanted to remember like my home address.
Yeah, we'll have to see if we stumble upon something that seems to make sense. So this is this is us giving it a named record. So push is going to give it a, a generated name. All right, so it's going to be basically the same thing as this, uh, except um, it's probably not going to look like another record or another record too. It's going to look like some gibberish, right? All right, so come in here. So now what we should be able to do is we should just be able to replace the child with push let's look but do you still need to get the, the child I understand but do you need to ask it for a child of that first It should, it should automatically okay. Oh, wait, no, here's a push and then a set. So what I'm doing is pretty much, a, I'm, I'm, I'm just not storing it in an intermediate variable. So I'm getting my reference here and then immediately setting. Right? Yeah, they do the same thing right here. Oh, and it actually saved it? We'll call this guy blah two. And that's an LOL Illinois. <laughs> I'm surprised there isn't a town named LOL. All right. So this should give us unique looking name. All right, so that's that guy. Yes. Uh, if it's not doing that, then that probably means you didn't get uh, um, uh, Express Generator installed correctly. That would be my right. But did you use the? Did you get this whole directory structure that we have here? Like, do you have all these folders? Okay. And if you're inside there, you should be able to do npm start. And what does your say when you do that? It says this? But Okay, well then it should be running. Okay, well, that's less about the that stuff and more about your code here. So make sure you have, you've included Firebase in there, and you, you, you installed Firebase with NPM, like we did before, and then you have some references. So when you actually go into Firebase, you said you, you it, what, just says null? <clears throat> And up here, what the name of your stack there is the same as you've put into your code here? Should be this part right here. Because you changed it or because you're... Yeah, 
Yeah, but I think they still assign you a... Alright, so this is creating multiple things, and then you said that I can not say set and just say the push. I wonder what the difference is there. Oh, hold on, so you would just say stuff ref dot push, and all this stuff would be inside the parentheses of the push? So it's that. So it seems like this is just syntactic sugar for doing a push set. So let's do that. I just did a blah three. Okay, so push and push set are, I guess, the same. All right, so now we should be able to well, let's think about this. So if I want to update some of the keys. What I would need to do is I would be looking at this one, and let's say that this was the path. Is there a way for me to copy this directly? Oop, definitely don't want that. Well, let's just do it on another record. So if I do dot child another record. And then I try to set author equal to Mike. Let's try that. <clears throat> Stuff ref dot child another record dot update. So this should take our stuff, add on to it the another record, specific endpoint, and then I'm going to set author to Mike, and we're updating the value of that guy. So that should change just the author from Firebase to Mike on that guy. Is that our understanding? All right. There it is, author Mike. All right, so that's updating a record, um, which means we should be able to directly access those things then, like this. And it's another record. So I should be able to come to this URL and do another record and it should show me the XML for that. Oh, it brings me all the way in here, but that's fine. I guess I expected it to spit out the JSON version of of this as opposed to rendering it inside of uh, uh, Firebase's site, but that's fine. Okay, so that's update. 
set versus update versus push. So let's see which transaction. Use our transactions feature when working with complex data that could be corrupted by concurrent updates. Okay, so transaction effectively means synchronized. So if we have a counter that we're updating, we might want to uh, use a transaction to increment it uh, rather than a push or something because you might have a race condition where two guys update the thing at the same time. So transaction, I'm guessing, blocks it, keeps, keeps that from happening at the same time. Okay, so there's that. Let's look at the saving transactional data. Yeah, it's like a counter. Uh, let's see, so this is update votes. That's just a reference, it's fine. Um, we're doing it as a transaction, and when you pass it a function that gets the current value, and then it returns um, the current value plus one. So this actually takes a closure. But this must specify the posts, and then this must be a, it's not a very handy place to put this, uh, upvotes is, is the name of it. Oh, there it goes. All right, so this is specifically a datum of this record. So I should be able to say another record slash author and that should just give me the mic. So it allows me to drive into the actual data that way. Okay, fair enough. So the JSON is walked via endpoints. All right, so that's transactional data. We have offline rights. By which users have read and write access. All right, we'll look at that later. So let's look at retrieving data now. Okay, so, so we can attach an asynchronous callback to read the, oh, this is how they handle the change. Well, this is going to be actually pretty slick. All right, so what they're doing here is, so this is hitting this thing called posts. And whenever there's a value added to posts, uh, so this is an asynchronous callback to read the data at our post reference, we're going to have a function that's taking in a single parameter and we're just going to write out the snapshot for val. Now I think where this is going to be interesting, you know, we should be able to prove the way this works. Let me uh, look at this real quick. All right, so we're going to read from stuff, and I'm going to change the author for one of them. So let's steal some of this code. Okay, and this is going to be stuff ref, right? On value, this dude. That's what 
whatever. Okay, and this is anything and stuff changes. We get this this thing. So let's see what it spits out. We'll spit out Val first, but I have a feeling that Snapshot will be the JSON itself. Okay. So we're going to run this, and then we're going to manually change it in the database and see if we can get our node server to spit out that, like, notice it's been changed, which is that cool thing that we liked about Firebase that everybody becomes aware when, when something updates. And if this works the way it sounds like it should work, I don't think MongoDB stands much of a chance. Um, okay, so let's go up here. Okay, so it spit all that stuff out. So it must grab it once by default. That's what it looks like. So this reads everything from uh, the the stuff endpoint. All right, so now let's go and change something. Bob. Where? I missed it. So it rewrote all of it? Yep. I changed Bob, it, why did it refresh everything? This has to be a function of what I'm printing out here. So stuff ref on. Let's look. Yeah, that's what it looks like to me. When really you might want to just be notified when when the individual thing changes. All right, so let's look at the documentation. We run this code, we'll see an object containing all of our posts logged to the console. This should be called anytime new data is added to our database reference, and we don't need to write any extra code to make this happen. This callback function receives a data snapshot, which is a snapshot of the data. A snapshot is a picture of the data at a particular database reference at a single point in time. Calling val on snapshot returns the JavaScript object representation of the data. Okay. Okay, so here's the different types we're doing on value right now. Value event is used to read a static snapshot of the contents at a given database path as they existed at the time of the read. Once when the initial data in again, okay, so this happens once as we saw, and then again every single time the data changes. All data at that location, okay. So value, every single time it gets called, gives you all data at that location, uh, including any child data. Okay, yep, so this is the behavior it did. So it does as advertised. So there must be something else that must do what I was looking for it to do. All right, child added. Event is typically used when retrieving a list of items from the database, and like value, which returns the entire contents of the location, child added is triggered once for each existing child, and then again every time a new child is added to the specified path. Um, the event callback has passed a snapshot containing the new child's data for ordering purposes. Okay, whatever. This is on child added. So initially, this is going to give us, here, we'll just steal the code. Initially, this should give us everything. And then if we were to add a new one, um, we're, we're actually just going to console log 
snapshot val. Actually, no, we can click author, that's title. Well, this could be interesting. Previous child key tells us who the previous guy was. Well, we'll just print this. All right, so when we run this initially, it should give us all of them. So like, at least I'm thinking it's how I'm reading it. So since we don't have any currently here, it brings everything up to date unless we have to use... Does it say here? It's typically used when retrieving a list of items from the database. And like value, which returns the entire contents of the location child added, is triggered once for each existing child. And then again every time. Okay, so the value gives you a dump of everything in that table. Child added, if you have five things in the table, initially child added will get called five times, one for each of those five things. And then it'll get called again every single time something new is added to the database. Okay, fair enough. So if we run this, okay, there's our initial call for each thing that's currently there. Uh, now I don't think changing something is going to make a difference, so we'll we'll prove that real quick. Um, oh yeah, or in other records, they didn't have those things defined. Okay, so now I'm going to go and just change a value, which I don't think should trigger anything in here. Let's use that exact value. We'll call Dave there. So that does not trigger it, but I should be able to add something new. And, uh, oh, I have to like, here, we'll just do an author, Bill, whatever. So at the very least, he should have been notified. Was he? Where? I gotcha. So really what's throwing this off is the uh, previous post thing. No, that's, 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 the, that's the name of the post. That's like what you need to identify. And that's what you added. Did I? Yes. <clears throat> another, another, another oh. Well, that's weird. Okay, so that was removed. So if you do that again, it should stop. Like type in the name. And then build. Like random stuff. Okay. Oh, I gotcha. And then you can give yourself an author. And this is Bill. Okay, and then we can do location, but we don't even need a location, so we can just do title, um, woot2, and just say that's good. There we go, bill woot2. All right, so it's pretty handy that it pushes to... Everybody, well, it pushes to the server. So what we'll have to explore is then how do our, how do we get that to different web endpoints? Kind of thinking ahead, if we have a list of available, um, 
like requests for snow removal, and I'm looking at my web page, and uh, a well, let's say I'm I'm the I'm I'm a provider, and I'm looking at the the web page, for example, and you go and request snow removal, I should see my site update automatically. Well, possibly. See, we're getting an asynchronous call back here on the node server, so that's still up here. So the server is going to then say, okay, I just became aware that there's new data. Now, how does he get that data to the end? So, right there, the, the last call, or the last thing that it had was the one that was added. Correct. Yeah, so I have it. I'm the server. So let's say you guys are all connected clients. So you're, you're a mix of iPhones and web. Okay, and I'm the server, and I just got this. This is a new snow removal request. I was just notified. I don't know which one of you did this, <laughs> okay, but one of you has made a request for snow removal. And I have that information now. And I, and I want to let the rest of you know about it. Does that make sense? Okay, in my mind right now, the way that I would historically do this is with a WebSocket. So all of you would have already connected in um, to the node server and established a WebSocket. But my understanding with Firebase is that part's handled for you. So it probably is something with Angular on the, on the front end where Angular can become aware of that change and update it. This is on the server. That's, that's, the, that's the picture I'm painting here. Yeah, so this is happening at the node server. This is one place. So, you know, he updated the database. I became aware of that update at the server level because when he updated the database, he updated the database over there. The database then let me know that something was changed. I'm the server. Now I need to somehow let all of you know. And historically, the way we would do this is with WebSockets, where all of you would have a monitored connection with me through a WebSocket, where I would just go through and I would basically blast that information out to each and every one of you by just spinning through all the open WebSockets doing it. But my understanding is that Firebase should have a mechanism for the Angular side of things, um, which was the first thing we looked at, where you can include Firebase in your, uh, uh, in your actual web page. He should be able to become notified when an event occurred, an asynchronous event occurred, and then we can just update the current web page with that new piece of information. Does that make sense? I think that's the way it should work. That's... That's Firebase's claim to fame, if you will. Okay, well, this is handy in and of itself. So we're already one, one step of the way there because my node server is aware of something that just got changed in the database somehow, and the database lives nowhere near this. It's somewhere else. Okay, so that's cool right off the bat, but it would be even cooler if we had a web page that could benefit from this, and we're going to... We will mess with that here shortly. Okay, so that is a child added event. All right, child changed event is triggered anytime a child node is modified. Okay, that's that's the one that I was going for, right? When you change the author or something like that, I want to become aware that that change has happened. So let's just steal that. And it looks like it's only doing this on title, so we'll update titles for our sample. All right, so on child change, the updated post title is whatever. All right, so we'll restart the server. Rep row. Stuff ref dot two, two dots. Okay, so this guy currently is not showing anything because nothing's changed, right? That event only happens when it changed. You can set up multiple events. We can get the, the data or what was it on values, um, child added. Now we're doing the changed. So I should be able to go in here and change one title. So it's this guy here. And we're going to change this to... Um, Deadpool, 
assume all of you saw that movie. No. Oh, Carla? She was supposed to, but she stood us up. <laughs> it was actually the worst part. She was supposed to, uh, so it was me, Tim, um, Tim's ambulance driving friend and his girlfriend, Blade went, and then Carla was supposed to come with, like, her oldest daughter. So I bought tickets, right? <laughs> stood us up. So that was an expensive movie. Pay 45 bucks for one seat. <laughs> but I had plenty of elbow room <laughs> in a sold out theater. Okay, so, uh, oh, I just changed it, right? So this guy should have become aware. Yep, the updated post title is Deadpool. Cool. Okay, so we have that. Child removed, so if it got deleted, that should be pretty self-explanatory. Um, child moved. Okay. Let's see. Event guarantees. These events will always be triggered when local state changes. Events will always eventually reflect the correct state of the data, even in a case where local operations or timing cause temporary differences. Okay, so we can trust, especially on web applications, that even if we have a network loss, eventually it will receive the data. So uh, events must be confirmed. Writes from a single client will always be written to the server and broadcast out to the other users in order. Okay, I don't know what that means. Does that mean it's guaranteed to eventually get written to the server? It was triggered last. Okay, this last one's a little bit important. So on value, that, that the first event we looked at, that guy is always triggered last out of the collection of events. So if things update, update like we get a new title, we will receive that event first before we receive the, the dump of all records inside that table. So we can rely on that for, you know, I guess updating the screen. So for instance, if we receive a title uh, update, we might decide just to change one thing on the screen as opposed, and then we might mark as we just received new information. If the very next uh, event we receive is a value event, we might be tempted to rewrite the entire page because we have a whole bunch of new data, but the reality is we might know about the data we just got from the value changed or the child changed. All right, so since value events are always triggered last, the following example will always work. So on child added, we're going to add something. This will say initial data loaded. Always equal count since snap.val will include every child added event. Oh, 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 I see. So up here on child added, remember we looked at child added. So if you had five records, this guy would get called five times. As opposed to with five records, this guy would get called once with all five records, right? Now, since this guy happens last, that means this guy is going to get called five times before this gets called its one time. So what does this guy do each of those five times? He's incrementing a variable called count, so it should, in the end, be five. Um, he is uh, then writing out um, added snap.key, whatever. Okay, so this is a counter that's going to be five. Then this guy gets called one time. Um, and he's going to say initial data loaded. 
um, object keys, whatever. And so this is going to be the length of things that was given to him, which is going to be five records. And that should match count, which is the number of records we've already personally counted. Does that make sense? And that works because we were able to guarantee that this guy happens after this happened every time. So our count is now complete. So we've counted five before we receive our five things. Kind of a contrived example, but whatever. Okay, then we can detach callbacks if that makes sense for us. So if uh, uh, we were writing like a chat server or something like that, we could decide that if we're disconnecting, we probably don't want to be echoing all the chat commands that we've ever seen. Okay. Uh, reading data once. In some cases, it may be useful for a callback to be called once and then immediately removed. Um, okay. Yeah, that's interesting. So this was kind of like that value thing. So on value is a is helpful because it gives us basically a dump of the, the that table. Right. Here's the five records that are in that table. Now the reality is is we probably are not going to be interested in all of the values in that table again. That's kind of initially populating our web page. So if we do uh, ref once and get the value, that guy will go ahead and populate our page initially, you know, so to speak, and then we disconnect it so that'll never get called giving us the JSON dump of the entire table again. Uh, and then from that point forward, we can add on to whatever's on the screen by receiving when there was, there was child updated or child added, those things, and adding just the new stuff. Okay, querying data. Since all of us at Firebase think dinosaurs are pretty cool, okay, blah, blah, blah. There's dinosaur facts. Okay, so let's just steal this. Okay. Oh, thank you. All right, so we don't have a height, so we can order by title, I guess. I assume it'll do alphabetical. Um, on child, on child added. That's not going to work on this particular data. Is they're adding this collection of dinosaurs. I think what we really, to see this, we can do it this way. So we want to say this on, what was it, on value? We'll order by title. Snapshot dot val. So this should, I guess, alphabetize our records on title. That's what I'm thinking that's going to do. And it is on value, right? Yeah, then there's a thing called order by value. As opposed to order by child title. All right, let's run this. I think this should give us our on value records in alphabetical order by title. Deadpool. Oh. 
That's not an order by title. Not even close. <laughs> what? It's because you're you're in the stock. You're not. <laughs> you're not inside the records. So all I have access to is this. So if I say order by, actually that's probably the thing. Order by value, right? Order by value, which I think is the example I was just looking at out here. Yeah. So we should get, I assume the another record should come first. Makes reasonable sense. So I guess dashes come before A. Um, well, there is. We can go in and uh, just change the names of those couple things. So this guy is now good. Oh, wait, oh can, I, can I change that? It won't let me rewrite that guy? Just add a, add something with B. Well, I was trying to change the name of this one. Can you? Yeah, I, I'm I'm pretty positive it will. I'm more interested now in changing this. Do I have to? No, I don't want to delete that for good. So I I can't change the name of. I click that. Let me change it now. Well, possibly. It lets me change everything else. I mean, I don't, you're not necessarily wrong. Okay, so that means if I, I should be able to then do this then. Um, which one was popping up first down here? Another record was coming... Before, okay, so I'm going to change another record to, to something that starts with a B. I can't change this one either. So I set this one. Correct. So when I first created this, it made sure it was unique. Which means that I should not be able to create a, another one called another record to yell at me. Another record. And this is going to be author. Whoops. And title. Gotcha. Oh, so it did overwrite the one that was already there. So it's impossible to add a duplicate because if you try to use a duplicate, it overwrites what was already there. All right. Here's a real easy way to test this. <laughs> we can delete all these random guys so we can name our own. Well, right, but the nothing was coming before the dashes. So now I have things that we can, except we have this thing called location now, right? Isn't this a top level one? Both of these guys are. So that must have been one of our, our bugs. All right, so now we have another record, another record two. Perfect. This guy was just a mistake.
Oh, that was our top level one. I get it. So I should be able to get rid of this and get rid of this. Leaving me with just the subtable of stuff, correct? And who does this title belong to? Nothing? That we're that we've deleted. Okay. So now I should be able to create a new guy here. Um with a B. Let's do a Z then a B name. So Z Z Z. That should just be good enough, actually. Shouldn't it? That's not enough to just create just the name. Author Z Man. Okay, and then we'll do a B. Title Bumblebee. Okay. Oh, and it actually stores them in order. So it shouldn't be surprising that it. Uh, it is, but. Oh, there we go. So the Z was the last one. Then the B, then another record two, then another record. Okay. So then what other sorting things can I do? So we're looking at querying. So I can order by child. Looks like I should be able to order by child author. I should have been able to order by title before. When I said order by child, that should go into the record. So I should be able to order by author. that Why why am I not able to order it by child here? So here's the first value. So author is a child of this guy, right? Another record two has a child here. B 
B does not have a child. Z, Z, Z does. Is it because one of them was missing an author? So if I go in and I add an author to B, Betsy. It's in stuff, order by So if I say stuff ref dot child author order by value. Stuff ref dot child author is going to show me just the authors, right? If I do this, I do slash author. Oh, because there isn't that's not a child. Inside of what? I mean, I think I would have to do, I think stuff another record author exists, but stuff author does not exist. So the only child under stuff is another record, another record to B and ZZ. So I could order by Well, yeah, but you'd have to pass it the, when you say order by value, that's the list of the unique IDs. You can't say order by child scores order by value look at the last three okay so let's look at the dinosaur stuff so order by child so this is going to all the dinosaurs and we're ordering by child height and their dinosaur data looked like this up here This is a unique identifier. This is a unique identifier.
order by child weight. Okay, so I think it's this. I need to do dot child author order by value. I'm saying specifically look at authors. Except this isn't a child. That's a field of a child. The children of stuff are the individual unique IDs. Hmm. Well, no. If we look here, the children of stuff. Stuff has four children. Another record, another record, two, B, and Z, Z, Z. Right, but how do I get to, how do I get to their children? This guy has a, 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 a child name author, this guy has a child name author, so on and so forth. But if I want to order by this one's child, child, child? But I would need to get this guy's name first. Because this guy is a callback. This is saying give me everything that's in stuff. So now I'm saying whenever we get stuff from stuff, I don't have access to those individual children until I'm in here. Well, I think with this guy, it's a full, and that's just like a, that's a JSON object containing all the JSON objects. So is there a way for me to actually order by like a querying data? Order by child, order by key. could order nodes by a common child key by passing that key to order by child. For example, to read all dinosaurs ordered by height, we can do the following. Order by child height on child added. And just dinosaurs. This would be our similar item point stuff. Order by, and that acts like it should be the same thing. 
So order by child author. Unless this just doesn't work on value. I'm doing it on values, not child added. Well, it prints the current database. Yeah. And I'm saying order that by author. This doesn't ask it to change. This just says this is the values. This isn't one of the change events. I mean, so if I go in here and I change the author of this guy to Alan, should update, I would assume. Oh, it already did. Yeah, I mean, it's not ordering by, by author. Isn't this the same thing as the list of dinosaurs up here? This is one of our unique keys, and it has a, ch a child. Hey, unless you can't do these on strings. Well, it is, but I don't think it has to be. I mean, we could do this on, uh, what is it, child, what's the first call, uh, the second one we looked at? Or is it child added that gets called the first time? That's value. So child added gets called once, once for each thing initially. So you're thinking that it's not that we have it written incorrectly, but specifically value doesn't, it doesn't make sense to do order by on value. There could be some truth to that. Well, looks like you would be right. It worked great for child added. So then what's the purpose of the purpose of values then or value why would you ever want the list of value if you didn't have control over its order so it seems like values by definition are just ordered by unique ID and the reason you would get value let's just look at their The value event is used to read a static snapshot of the contents of a given of a, at a given database path, as they exist at the time of the read event, and is triggered once with the initial data and again every time the data changes. The event callback is passed a snapshot. Well, 
Well, but you didn't change any of the data. But this gets called every single time anything in the database it gets called initially, and then every single time anything in the database changes. And you might very well be interested in making is is always having the current version ordered by author. So, well, except if I have five things in the database, child added gets called five times. Values gets called once with all five things in it. I suppose the difference is, is that the values gives me uh, essentially a wall of JSON that I have to then go through and parse. Um, like we did up here. So here is a, I mean, this is just a bunch of JSON that I would have to directly parse as opposed to this. Each individual call gives me an object that I can use to pull individual pieces of information out of that I might want to use to populate a, um, I guess, I guess populate a web page. But having said that, if this gets called five separate times and I have a template, yeah, we're going to have to look at ang how the Angular update. Because what happens if we want to do something similar to what we did last time, where we have a DVD collection, right? And so inside of our database, we have five DVDs. And now we get those five DVDs as five distinct calls, you know, on, on value change or, or uh, child changed or whatever, child added. How do I use my J template to show me a, 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 an ordered list or an unordered list of DVDs if I got each individual DVD in a separate asynchronous call? I would instead have to, I think this is it. I would instead have to collect that data and then on values, take advantage of the fact that values always gets called last. After you've already collected everything, you can take on values and say, okay, well now I know I have all of my rows. I know I've collected all of my DVDs. You put them in an array or something like that. Now I can go ahead and render my template because I have all my stuff. Does that make sense? So that seems like it's the one-two punch of using that on values thing. So it's on values is not that handy in and of itself. Uh, other than just kind of giving you a quick visual dump of the database, or if you're in a situation where walking the database's JSON directly is, is advantageous. You just have a bunch of JSON, you're going to say, okay, well, rather than using their query stuff, I'm just going to walk this myself and get whatever. But it seems like its real claim to fame is that it's the last guy that gets called. So you can rely on getting individual objects from it through the um, the added thing, and then update on the values. Yeah, I think that's which would even work on uh, what we were saying earlier with Node. Um, so initially, I would get my five DVDs, and I would spit it out to the the website. You know, the person who uh, was connected. Well, I still need it be able to get it out to the person who's connecting because this isn't an endpoint. This is just an asynchronous thing letting me know about the data. But in any case, if I'm the server, I currently have five DVDs um, in maybe an array. And then on values, I could then, you know, I know I've read in everything. So I'm in a state right now where I have the full DVD collection in an array of DVD objects that I can send out to somebody. Then we're going to have the Angular side of things where it says, um, okay, give me the current DVDs. So I give it the array of five DVDs. And then the state of that variable changes on the server because I'm going to add a sixth one when um, uh, child added gets called. So I'm going to add that sixth one to it and then on 
actually Angular will grab that data automatically, so I don't even need to use the on value. Other than to just uh, you know like mark that I have a you know maybe a timestamp when something was last updated. All right, so it seems like the real magic with this is going to be connecting it with Angular. Um, so we can see when those things update in a like a generic web page. So just quickly here, do they show us? So these are our events on the. I don't think so. I mean, because your server side is going to be hosting websites initially. So, uh, I mean, I, I think I think what you said might there might be some truth to what you said because when our web page hits our node server, we're going to use Jade like we did last time to output the current web page, and inside that we're going to be embedding some Angular, and that Angular is going to know how to dial back into Firebase. Um, and receive his own events when things update. So even though Express knows how to get those same events as well, um, the way it gets those events might not, the, when a new DVD is added, for example, it might not get that from Node. It might get that directly from Firebase through Firebase's uh, Angular. So I think that's what we need to uh, explore after break. Let me just see real quick if there's, a, if it's clear that they have Structuring data. Well, no, and, and that's true. So it's going to make sense to go through our node server whenever we have an endpoint for whenever it makes sense for there to be a shared endpoint. It's going to make sense to talk to Firebase directly whenever it doesn't. One concern I have, though, is the security on the Angular side, so we'll have to look at that. The way that Firebase works is go to Firebase, and then go into the security and rules. So it's the second it's going to come up right there. That's where you set all your rules for everything. Well, no, that's fine. But if I'm sitting here on my web browser and my web browser is talking to the Firebase database out there, um, you know, there's a concern that uh, what can the end user see in terms of credentials and stuff like that than what's had being handed out over the internet. I'm sure it's. Well, right. That says who's allowed to use it, but that doesn't say the nature of what the data looks like if somebody were to like packet sniff it or something like that. I'm sure it is probably secure. It's probably an SSL connection. Um, but that would be the, yeah, so right now it's, it's read and write for what, everybody? Okay, so let's take a 20 minute break and when we come back we're going to try to set up a small Angular example where he gets updated whenever something is new updated and then we want to look at authentication. Okay, fair enough. So I'll stop this.